Welcome to Full Prefrontal, the show that exposes the mysteries of executive function. This podcast is a collection of conversations about the role of the prefrontal cortex, which impacts your focus, planning, problem solving, emotional balance, and independence. So join us as we explore executive function and the science of learning. And now, here's your host, the founder of EXQ, Sucheta Kamath. Welcome to Full Prefrontal. It's so exciting to be here with you once again. We will be talking about executive function, teacher preparedness, and many, many things that make the learning and and thinking journey for students more successful. And uh, just to share with you, you know, recently I read uh, this 2018 USA report, which talked about uh, that teachers were worried about many things. And and people would think that they were worried about money, but no, they were talking about feeling misunderstood, feeling unheard. Uh, They are also feeling disrespected. And one of the things that was striking to me that um, the disrespect they felt was coming from many, many sources, not just one, which is parents who were either under-involved or too involved, was creating a lot of stress for them. Government mandates that dictated how they do the job that they're supposed to do and how it's measured and then reflected back about uh, onto them as as if they are competent or not. Uh, then all this constant story about changing budgets. Uh, and lastly, this all these stresses were leading to inadequately prepared teachers who are feeling uh, incredibly inadequate. So my question to myself was, is is this story motivating us to change uh, the way we think and support teachers? Do we understand the the teaching profession well enough to see, uh, are we willing to change uh, our ways? And what are some of the barriers uh, historically looking back as well as um, thinking about executive function, which is a total brand new Uh, to the seat. So with that in mind, it is such a pleasure and honor to have this amazing guest today. Uh, This is Elizabeth Green. She's the CEO and co-founder of Chalkbeat, the nonprofit news organization dedicated to improving educational equity through local independent high impact journalism. Since launched, launching in 2014, Chalkbeat's reporting has spurred changes in education funding, legislation, policy, and practice, and is regular, regularly cited uh, or republished in dozens of publications, including New York Times and Wall Street Journal, um, and even Atlantic. And uh, she is the author. I would be talking a lot about this amazing book she wrote in 2014, I think 15, uh, Building a Better Teacher, How Teaching Works. So with great pleasure, uh, welcome to the podcast, Elizabeth. How are you? Thank you so much. I'm good. How are you? It's so great to be here. Well, thank you for being here. I I love to, since we talk about executive function and we talk about our guest who brings their expertise and uh, my goal here to show the intersectionality between many varied topics because executive function impact our decision-making, our self-management, our goal-directed persistence. I wanted to ask you before we dive into your subject matter expertise, how are your executive function skills and when did you form you think first learned the term in your learning and development context yeah i um i don't remember when i first learned the term executive function but i do think it was probably in the context of reporting about schools not um not in the context of being a reporter or and thinking about myself or being now a ceo and thinking about myself of a nonprofit. Um, But I think it was about, you know, putting that lens because of your work, putting that lens on children and saying, okay, have they learned, you you know, there's actually a bucket of things that that challenge that is a developmental of developmental importance. And I remember having definitely an aha moment like, wow, that's a really important bucket of things. Um, so that's I'm sure there's a line that we can draw from your work to my aha moment I just can't remember quite where I was or when Um, you know and it's so interesting the reason I ask even because here we are uh, executive function skills I love to explain to teachers that uh, you know anytime I bring in the conversation that you need to teach these skills they say my plate is full I'm already teaching so many things and I say no this is the plate so it's the plate that supports learning of Uh, skills that allow you to learn how to learn. 
So um, that, that makes perfect sense. And it's been consistent with even researchers who study memory and attention. So uh, you're, you're right uh, in, it just tells a little bit of cultural evolution. We are here to talk about executive function, but none yes. of us have really received any training. So right. your, your interest in education, do you mind telling us a little bit about um, what sparked your interest in how teachers teach and how students learn? Yeah, well, um, I, so I, I think I started out as an, my interest in education started out because of my interest in my own high school. And I, um, that's when I started being a journalist was a student at my student newspaper in high school. And I was just really, you know, struck by um, the inequities in my school and the language at the time that was being used all around us of um, you know, the achievement gap was becoming a term that was very popular. And our principal went um, on the loudspeaker and said, you black and Latino students have to get your test scores up. And, you know, and he, uh, in the context no. of, yes, he did, yes. Oh my um, goodness. And, you know, I, we're all processing this and taking messages from this. And um, I ended up uh, writing a story for my high school newspaper. It was supposed to be about um, kids who lie to their parents. And it ended up being about Hispanic students at my school who felt under-recognized, under-acknowledged, um, mistreated, disrespected uh, by their teachers and like less was expected of them. And it was, it started for me with those human conversations about what, stu how students were um, moving through the world and the, the major experience of being in school um, and how that affected them developmentally. I decided I wanted to be a journalist and do more kind of reporting like that, um, that, I, you know, that would expose some of what was happening for students that can be so invisible for adults. Um, and that's what I set my path to do. But I really, you know, it took a while for me to return to that core of like what students are experiencing and how they're experiencing it. The, because it's so easy in education, I think to get, especially in the policy debates that journalists end up covering, we get lost in terms like achievement gap or, um, you know, uh, different policy debates, merit pay or um, charter schools. And we lose sight of that you know, the central reason we care is because we care about people and their developmental journeys. So, but I got back there because I got an assignment from the New York Times Magazine to write about the newest policy buzzword at the time, which was teacher quality. Yes. And um, so, you know, go write about teacher quality, Elizabeth, go figure that out. Great, amazing, like an assignment from the New York Times Magazine. I, you know, that was a, a dream come true for me. As I, as I began, the first layers of this argument, um, especially through that lens of that, again, very wooden word that's super disconnected from humans, um, the first pieces of that were all about uh, blunt policy instruments, you know, let's, let's pay teachers more or pay teachers less or give teachers bonuses if they if their students have higher test scores or fire 20 the bottom 25 percent of teachers never mind how do we determine who's in the bottom but the blunt instruments and um it's really interesting to think about why is that and you know etc but fortunately i got i was able to get out of that world and more into the the central dramas of you know student development student learning and actually what teachers do and I, I entered that through, through a different kind of research, the research on the practice of teaching um, that just completely captivated me. And the more I learned about the practice of teaching and the science of learning and how they intersect, the, the deeper and uh, more profound my appreciation became of how, how just why this, you know, the work of schools and teachers and young people matters. And then also what we get so wrong about it when we're back in this like world of policy and inhuman kind of approaches. So all of it, um, that's my, that was my journey into this. And I, I just, I, I can't get enough of sitting in the back of a classroom or 
walking between desks when we, you know, when schools are open um, and look <laughs> peering over a students, look at their paper or listen to the way they talk about ideas. Um, I can't get enough of that. It's, it's some of the most beautiful moments of my life have been spent. I think um, what doing I, that. I, first of all, I think it's such an um, endearing story to me because I think you humanized um, uh, the, the, the policy decisions that might be informed by outcomes, but the outcomes are so tied with the journey, with the preparedness. And I think the preparedness was so under understood or under uh, people, it was not on the radar, let's put it that way, right? So I wanna kind of start uh, us off with this idea of um, the myths that exist about, you know, either, and, and you, you talk about this and then there's, uh, you know, other people have talked about this journey of how education came into being, <laughs> even when it became mandatory that we're gonna teach everybody uh, that they thought, who can we hire? Ooh, this is a costly affair. Yes, <laughs> you know, right. Yes, so, exactly. Ooh, let's hire women. This was in um, <laughs> late uh, late nineteenth um, century, I guess. And uh, so we we have a lot of myths about uh, who is a good teacher, and and somehow you talk a little bit about this this magical quality. You know, Michelle Pfeiffer, and you know, we have this uh, you know Marva Collins story. So somehow these are people who. Uh, are unique. Um, don't mess with it. That was one time thing. Don't ask to repeat it. Yes. So, so why why do does the culture why is culture stuck there? Or what what are some of the myths we carry that are so harmful to our approach to preparing the teachers? Yeah, it's such a good question. Um, and and as you're saying, like what what I concluded was in this journey for me was that we have so paid so little attention to the intricate and complex work that is both human learning and teaching because teaching is just the facilitation of human learning and so if you don't understand just how complex that work is then you underinvest in the infrastructure that's required to support that work um so i mean i think that that it really does come down to deep cultural ideas that so many cultures hold about how learning works that are just too simple, right? And where we don't appreciate um, the, the complexity of the way we're all taking in the world and we start out with ideas and then we challenge those ideas and we learn it socially, we learn um, by uh, making so meaning. Amazing. Yeah making meaning right not um and and i think just a, in a lot of cultures we don't put too much consideration into learning we think you either know or you don't know and um you know i don't i don't hold our cultures you know culpable or i don't judge our cultures for that for that stance you know one of the people that i write wrote about in the book <laughs> Um, who uh, recently passed away, David Cohen, one of the great oh, yes. um, scholars of education. Um, he always talked about how uh, we should keep in mind just how radical uh, the human experiment of public education in America is, you know, to begin with, the idea that we would in mass educate people to a standard of every single person um, you know, engaging in empirical analysis and um, questioning reality is countercultural to the mass of human history when we as humans, you know, really took things so much for granted and, and, and didn't create our own knowledge. It's, it's, so anyway, um, sometimes <laughs> I think about that, that we're holding ourselves to this incredible and laudable standard that, uh, but also we should give ourselves a little bit of a pass. Like this is gonna be a long journey, right? And so for our cultures not to understand the complexity of learning, that's okay, but we can get there because so, so much literature exists now, as you know, that helps us see differently. And so we can start to change. And you know what's so uh, uh, interesting thing uh, about that initial um, expose that you talk about that we think teachers have some magical qualities. They're they're right. uh, all ha have this 
ability to kind of mesmerize children into learning. Uh, you know, some you have it or you don't have it. <laughs> no, it doesn't work. Like more training you have, better you you can be at it. And and uh, the other thing that I also was thinking about as we talk about teaching is it's to me, uh, you know, teaching but learning by default means not knowing. So we shouldn't mm -hmm. be really be so harsh about not knowing. I mean, mm -hmm. the not knowing only after knowing leads to knowing. <laughs> so, yes. so, so that exploration almost somehow that there's so much burden on teachers to not allow somebody being in the state of not knowing that I feel mm -hmm. that there's a great pressure of you oh, make yes. that knowing happen for that person. Um, and another thing, as you said, this idea that, you know, even the older school system where you would have entire one teacher, entire class made from children who are six years old to 16, yes. but one classroom, right? Yes, <laughs> and, yes, and so we yes. are making this knowing happen for all of it. Yes, there are some parts that knowing can be facilitated, but after that, the level of interest, motivation, all those change. So, so let's kind of think about this, uh, this idea that um, the, uh, then, you know, the perception that the teachers, uh, um, knowing how to teach you yourself underwent some transformation that wow this is a skill and and some preparation yes. goes into uh building the skills yes. for a teacher so can yes. you talk uh, talk about what skills um yes. came, came to surface for you that you realize that these skills need to be taught to the teachers yes Yes, and um, I call it the myth of the natural born teacher. So yeah. if you believe that learning is something that you either have or you don't, knowledge is you either have it or you don't, and you don't think about the work that goes into creating it, then um, it follows that it's easy to assume that teachers, the, their work is magical. It's to make learning happen, right? Yeah. And so one a, example is um, this idea that teachers are um, really good performers. Like the, if they can make it so captivating and tell it in a really clear way, uh, then they're doing this performance and then kids will just, ooh, they got it, right? Or another is that teachers just are really good with children. And that's, you know, they, they just have, um, they're actors or they have make connections with children. And all these things actually are grounded in practices that teachers do need to have. But what I came to realize is that the work of teaching is so hard that you can't just bring, you know, a captivating personality yes. to bear. And actually you can be quite a quiet personality and a soft personality and be wildly successful. Um, and you can't just bring um, relationship skills to bear. There's so much more that you have to do. Um, one of the things that, uh, and one of the early lessons I had in seeing what exactly teaching requires had to do with um, the, the, uh, a math problem that I was given um, by somebody else I write about in the book, Deborah Ball. And she asked Love me her. not to solve the math problem um, but instead to explain how a child would get the following wrong answer. And she showed me the wrong answer. And I was just, it was a simple multiplication problem, but I could not figure out how the child would get that wrong answer. And um, she, you know, then when she showed me how the child would get the wrong answer, it, that was a kind of magic actually, because I thought, wow, um, you know, how did you know that? How did you know that? And what she helped me see on the journey that followed is that, um, you know, she did this research project through the work of her own teaching, looking at her own knowledge as it um, formed as she became a better teacher over the course of many years. And she realized that she was um, learning a kind of math that isn't taught in school. It's not about right answers only. It's also about understanding how students misunderstand and mistakes maybe. reverse engineering the source of these mistakes, surfacing them so that they she can understand where the student is on their developmental journey, and then devising a 
way to unearth, unseat that misunderstanding. And so if I thought about that and, um, you know, not just that one problem on that one day that one student would present her and say, what, you know, this is what I think. And then she's doing this thinking, but all the other students in her classroom, and that's just one set of students. Many teachers teach multiple classes of students. And that's just one day um, in one year, right? Like how much do teachers have to know? It was, I, I was so awestruck by um, clearly what teachers are doing this, all this work to learn this. And it's, you know, it looks different in different disciplines, but in every discipline, there's these challenges. In, in a, a, one of the things I think we all know it when we see it about a great teacher or know it when we experience it as a student is that feeling of a great class whole group discussion. Yes. When you just, oh my gosh, like one idea is building on another and I'm just like really thinking a lot and I'm changing my mind and I'm compelled by what someone else is saying and I'm gripped and it, you know, there's drama and we start with a question and we end with different answers. You know, we come out a different person than we came in. Those, I, I've, I've now looked at studies where over the course of my reporting, I looked at studies where researchers looked at hundreds of thousands of classrooms across the country and hours of videotape of classroom discussions and the confirmed what our all of our also I think personal experience can confirm which is that those moments are so rare so <laughs> rare and that's because they're so difficult to construct and but it doesn't mean that it's impossible it doesn't mean that the people who do that are magic it, it's because they have learned something over time about how to facilitate learning and how to get a conversation going, a discussion happening. That, and, and actually one of the other scholars I write about in the book, Pam Grossman, um, she breaks down the, um, the different moves that uh, teachers can make in the art of facilitating whole group discussion. And as soon as she started to break it down, I could see, you know, again, just like that moment with Deborah Ball and the math problem, this is hard work. This is work like conducting an orchestra or learning to, um, you know, uh, climb a mountain. It has multiple facets. It's uncertain work. You never know exactly what's going to come next. Very improvisational. You can't predict what students will say. You have to be in the moment listening for it. Um, and, and so, you know, all of this, like, again, it hooked me on because it's just fun to be in the presence of masterful teaching, but it's also inspiring to watch people build infrastructure that helps any teacher reach, climb the ladder toward mastery. Um, and it's sad and infuriating how rare that infrastructure is. You know what, uh, so many thoughts come to my mind. So to those people who haven't read Elizabeth's book yet, please do, because a lot of these things will become much clearer. But the example you were talking about was this uh, child or this pro math problem where if the car is traveling at 54 miles an hour uh, at in 15 minutes, how far it would have gone, which requires you to chunk the time into four quarters. And then half point of 54 is 27. Half point of 27 is what kind of what that was the mathematical thinking. But the student came up with the answer 18. Then the teacher has to not teacher has many choices, <laughs> but a teacher in a rush who doesn't understand the, the big self evident parts of learning through discovery mm -hmm. is to say, um, really, she should be inquisitive of why did you land on 18? Where does this mm -hmm. in the equation fit? Um, mm -hmm. I found that such an empowering exercise. And one thing that is very clear from um, your work and my, my, my own uh, work in teaching people individually versus in a group setting and training the teachers that somehow we are asking teachers to do teaching uh, that will make sense to all. And if you mm. know, um, in a group setting, 
if you bring prior knowledge, then you can make meaning faster. But if you don't mm-hmm. have prior knowledge, which is what children don't, <laughs> that they're children, then making meaning is, is context void. And then that's yes. what delays the learning for children. And, and so the teacher has to be on the lookout to see where the part of the context the child has missed. But that mm-hmm. requires so much time. And we are not affording time to the teachers. Well, and I don't so, mean and, in a And way. I just want to give credit, the, um, the, the teacher who did the 27 and a half problem that I write about is Magdalene Lampert. Magdalene um, Lampert, an yes. Incredible teacher, yes. Um, and that moment is just incredible that she takes she takes us into her mind as she is thinking in the moment how to respond in every single moment, how to catch what one student is is thinking while the rest of the students may all understand. As you say, it's very challenging to teach groups. But what I another thing I learned though to that point of the challenge of teaching groups is that there is an affordance also to a group yes. context, yes. right? Because um, there's some things that ha- learning is often social. And so having yes. multiple um, people in a room with different views actually can be incredibly exactly. productive for every student, every person's learning. And I think that's why we feel magic in the moment of whole group discussions that we can't possibly feel like if we're discussing a novel, we are reading the novel alone, even if we underline the points, we're having a very special, precious experience with the book, but there's something completely different experience that can be had in a really well taught class discussion. Similarly, um, you know, in Japan, a lot of my book um, draws on reporting I was lucky to do in Japan and Japanese elementary schools. And um, their approach to math teaching is completely and utterly dependent on the existence of many kids in the class because they're counting on humans making different kinds of meaning and they know they can predict, we can all predict what kinds of meaning different students will make, what kinds of mistakes are repeatedly gonna happen and when um, and what kinds of ideas are repeatedly gonna be generated. And so when, as a teacher, when you can know that a certain problem is likely to generate a certain set of solutions and in different types, then, and you have a whole group, that's a beautiful way to show, to open the minds of all of the students about solution pathways that they never would have thought of. And then when in that class uh, kind of routines of the Japanese math classroom, they will routinely then on the blackboard post the different types of solution sets and look for patterns across them. And that's another beautiful opportunity that we can have to learn that isn't possible with just one student. So I think, yes, there's some settings when there's nothing compares to one-on-one work that teachers do with with learners, but there's also some kinds of learning and ways of learning that are impossible to do without a group. Yeah, and I think if um, I can talk about the uh, uh, many things that you you brought to the surface, one is, you know, what makes the, or rather good teaching process should have modeling, uh, opportunity for individual uh, practice, and then some place where group discussion happens so that you can even see the modeling done by different people or encounter different ways of approaching the same problem. And then the second part that you were talking about, uh, you you mentioned uh, uh, even uh, the, um, the teacher preparedness and a Japanese perspective, the Japanese lesson planning, I guess, uh, Jugio Kenkyu, am I yes. saying that? Okay. Yes. Uh, that's the a, a bucket of practices that the, as you say, a bucket of practices that Japanese teachers use to hone their craft from observing each other at work to dis, uh, to discussing the lesson afterwards to studying curricula material with colleagues. Um, and well, I was I was showing this to my husband last night. I said, uh, and he he's a math F math fan, and uh, you know we as a family we are big fans of math math puzzles math you know joking with math kind of thing. And and this idea that even the teachers will talk about that 12 minus seven, 
versus mm. 13 minus six, mm -hmm. which mathematical equation is a good sample to mm -hmm. set the student up with for first time learning subtraction. Yes. And, and just that, that was such a brilliant example that you captured there. Um, can you tell us a little bit about these, uh, this, uh, the teacher's experience, particularly in America, uh, their journey as a teacher is very lonely. Uh, yes. And and this data that uh, that you presented with like um, American teachers are in front of the students uh, for 1000 hours in a given year versus Japanese teachers are maybe 600. Yes. But the remaining time, everything they do impacts the way they teach. Yes. Which is such a powerful way to make an impact. But we underestimate. We somehow right. have captured this this imagination that you can only teach if you're in front of the student. Right. I think that it, maybe an analogy that will help people who are spending the last year in Zoom meetings understand yes. is sometimes we feel frustrated in a work setting um, that's not the classroom about, you know, I'm all, all I do is sit in meetings. I never get any work done. And the, the, and for American teachers right. and students, the balance is similarly off. Like we, there's too much time on stage and not enough time sort of preparing thinking and making that stage time its maximally best use right and so um we everyone loses because of that and that and if you think about it it all goes back to the that foundational misunderstanding because if you think that teaching is just presenting and performing yes then why would you need to do anything off stage but even if i can ask you this even the theater performers we get recognize and acknowledge that they need rehearsals, they need practice. And we recognize that the stage performance is only three hours, but there was 30 hours of practice. Why are we missing out on that? Like, why is this not part of the psychology? Uh, and are you seeing any movement since you wrote the book? Uh, I know pockets of American schools and, and cultures of different regions of Amer uh, American educational practices mm -hmm. are able to individualize, but this is not a federal mandate. This is not a state policy. Are you seeing any movement in those directions? Yeah, I think um, there's kind of two stories of American education that are both true at the same time, I think. One is that um, is, is the sadder story, which is that we we, the, um, we, we often try to pour new wine, but it goes into the same bottle or an old <laughs> bottle, but new, uh, and, and I'm getting that wrong, but- I, I'm getting it though. <laughs> but we, it's very challenging to change. And so there will be an initiative that says, we must now have more group work, or we must now have um, less time in, in uh, lectures and, um, <laughs> And these come from well-intentioned places, but they, um, without the, the development of that full infrastructure, investing in teacher's knowledge, giving teachers real time to plan, um, creating better resources that are also standard and common so that what you learn in graduate school of education and teacher education program actually maps to what you're really gonna be doing when you're a teacher in the classroom. There's a tremendous lack of coherence there. Um, all of these factors just really, you couldn't design a system to make it more challenging to do this extremely complex work. And so I think that the most, the other story of American education though, is that, you know, that, that story of remember here, what we're doing is a radical experiment um, in our country and so many others where we're committed to a, a really ambitious task that every single person gets access to a kind of learning that most of human history, no humans um, <laughs> engaged in. And so we're doing this in like no time at all. And, you know, we do make steady progress. It's fumbling. It has three steps forward, four steps back, but it is, I think it is directionally positive. And some of the, I think most um, uh, inspiring changes have to be structural. They have to be yeah. thinking about that basic foundation of what is a teacher's experience and what is a student's experience of learning um, and what are the different materials, infrastructures, time elements that are touching them. And so, you know, I, it's before my, as I was writing my book, I was very um, fascinated by the, the emergence of networks of 
uh, charter schools, some of which are, you know, doing terrible things, but some of which are truly learning and adapting. And um, because they have the freedom from traditional school bureaucracy, they have been able to build um, an adaptive school systems where so often larger systems have struggled. And then also school systems themselves taking on um, within the traditional bureaucracy, real change efforts that invest in common infrastructure, at least in a single place and really make that experience for students and teachers better and better. So I do absolutely think you know, the arc is still, um, we have to, we have to hope, right? And uh, one of my favorite, um, uh, I think this is a David Cohen quote, again, I, I hope I don't have this right, but I, I hope I have this right, but I, I believe that he was the one who told me, you know, teaching is itself a profession of hope, both a oh. profession of hope, but also a proclamation of hope, because why teach if you don't believe in growth? There's, you know, it's, oh, it's yes. embedded in it is a faith and a belief in, in growth. So, um, you know, I think all of us in the education world should hold on to that. And, you know, you say something very hopeful too. You said, you know, while the average adult needs to have a working knowledge of many subjects, a teacher doesn't just need to know the right answer to the question. She also needs to know why students are going to get the answers wrong. And, and so in that way, that, uh, I love what you're capturing there is um, it's like a, it's becoming a chess teacher. <laughs> so you have to kind of not only know chess, but you also need to know in what many moves people will try yes. and how to guide them, you know? Yes. And, and what's, um, it, at first I, I described to you in the start of our conversation, a feeling of overwhelm that I had, oh my goodness, how could a teacher possibly know all of these things? The good news is kids are, are super individual, but they're not unique. You know, and we cut, we, all of us humans, we, we seem to follow the same tripwires, right? But <laughs> yes. we, we have patterns. And so there's not an endless and never ending number of mistakes that kids will make when they're trying to do subtraction with regrouping. There's a very discrete set of mistakes that kids will make. And, and so, you know, you can learn to anticipate those. And you can design as the Japanese teachers do, as you were saying earlier, you can learn collectively over time. Oh, you know what? 13 minus nine is a really good problem to start with when you're teaching subtraction with regrouping because it's most likely to generate, you know, the, the most common forms of misunderstanding so that we can surface them and get past them, but also the most common solutions um, to how to attack a subtraction with regrouping problems so that we have, multi, uh, you know, the, the widest toolkit of ways to, to think about taking a you know that number nine from that number three it's like still is hard for me to do right <laughs> how do you think about that um so I I see progress I do and and yeah I mean I think the uh and I I like to remind myself that the profession of teaching is young you know yes. we we have been learning on our own much longer than people have been teaching us intentionally <laughs> so smart I totally agree it's so, so true so we should be a little bit forgiving oh yes. but one thing I think if I can just list a few ingredients that you talk about is one teachers need training uh which does but mm -hmm. the teacher need training not in the content they should be teaching but what methodology actually yields success in the learning to take roots uh, I think that's where the mistake I see that there's a lot of emphasis on, uh, I see a chemistry PhD in chemistry teaching chemistry in high school. She knows a lot about chemistry, but she doesn't know the science of learning. Exactly. And so that can be a big disconnect. The second thing you say that there's training, this training should be based on activities and structure that has some universal um, lingo or acceptance that we all no. Common language. Common language. For example, you know, when I'm a speech and language pathologist, and if I say the the you know acronym MLU, that minimum a length utterance, it's going to be universally understood by every speech language pathologist. Of course, it's a, a very unique and quirky and has no value outside my field, but I know how what it is. I know how to calculate it. I know how to embed therapy based on the number that yields the, what the result is, right? So you can determine delay of language. That is a very powerful content knowledge that informs my, my, my craft. Such a good example. 
Yeah, and but there's nothing in education that universally teachers will say, I gotcha. My kid, blah, 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 that means blah, blah, blah. There's nothing, you have to describe the whole narrative. You're wasting a that, lot of time and it's unique. the English language, yeah. Oh, not in English language. <laughs> yeah, but but um, I, in, in Japan, there is a whole rich language about instruction and learning that doesn't exist in our country. Although I think some people are working hard and succeeding at developing common language, but um, it, it, you know, we have it, that the infrastructure I mentioned before is a necessary ingredient of developing such a language too. And you know, other thing that what struck me that teaching profession, so it's like, imagine I was talking, my husband is a, is a, a doctor and I was talking to him about this, that imagine an ER physician is also asked to take care of the scrubs other doctors wear. No, yeah. we don't keep him in charge of any of that, right? Yes. So here we have teachers who are not only in charge of teaching, but now if there is a fight among students, she's now in charge of discipline. Yes. She's also in, in charge of talking to the janitorial staff to make sure that the desk go back and whatever. Like, so the teacher, unfortunately, is in charge of so many things that are not uh, bane of her teaching existence or her his teaching existence. And we don't even bat an eyelid and saying that that's taking away the freedom and the brain power. Talk about executive function requirements. <laughs> exactly. So, well, then you're and not over actually taxing. Teacher. Overtaxing yes. the, uh, <laughs> the executive system for sure. But last thing, I think maybe you can uh, end us with this, that you talk about teachers need support uh, uh, in learning how to uh, teach uh, through mentors and guidance, uh, you know, guidance through mentorship. Um, observing and critiquing, and you, you know, quote many other countries doing that. Where one, why are we? Why is this not part of the teaching? This teachers do when when we train the teachers. Why is this not embedded? And secondly, um, how can this be done well? If you can share some examples of that, that'll be really helpful. Um, I feel like we don't have enough time for a hundred examples, but um, the um, uh, I'm trying to think how to put it in 30 seconds or less. The um, we have a, a tradition in teacher education of undervaluing teaching, even in teacher education. So we even in teacher education, there is a higher cultural value put on the history of education, the psychology of education, the sociology of education, the now the neuroscience of education, but not the practice of teaching itself. That is very undervalued. Those are the least paid, least well-resourced people, even in schools of education themselves. So this is like a deeply endemic challenge um, and it's our priorities are just wrong. And so rewriting those priorities is happening in institutions um, as people try, committed to reform, like Deborah Ball tried yes. to reform them, um, but it's a challenging enterprise. <laughs> yes. Well, well, thank you for being with us. Before I let you go, um, you are an author and I bet you're a prolific reader. Do you mind sharing with us uh, two books? Yes, I wrote them influenced. down. Yes, yes. Oh, no. um, you planned ahead. Great executive function. Okay. So um, I'm pull, pulling up the name. I don't want to get the names wrong. So I mentioned Magdalene Lampert um, as a character in my book, and I absolutely love her book, Teaching Problems and the Problems of Teaching, which oh, is that. just a amazing um, inhabitants of her, the mind of a teacher and a masterful teacher at that. As she, and uh, it's just brilliant. Um, and then I also absolutely am, was riveted by and return regularly to um, Carol Lee's book, Culture, Literacy and Learning, Taking Bloom in the Midst of the Whirlwind. And uh, similar to Magdalene Lambert, she recounts her own uh, cases of her own teaching um, in an urban area. Um, and I, I believe, I actually don't know if she names the area, but I believe it was Chicago and describes um, the, the cultural language of teaching literacy um, to black children 
it, but from a black teacher. Um, and it is also a just an absolute master class in, um, in the science of teaching. So those are two books that I relied on tremendously to write mine. So I thought I'd pick those for today. Oh, thank you so much. And once again, um, we are so grateful to have you. Uh, you have enriched my understanding, a question that would have not occurred to me until I actually read your book. So I thank you. I took thank it for you granted. So much. And, and lastly, um, I think, um, thank you for uh, starting this amazing nonprofit uh, that's tackling the issues of equity in education. And I track your work, I'm subscribed. So uh, I you. highly, we will be listing all that uh, in our show notes. Uh, so once again, thank you for being here. And listeners, if you love what you're listening, please uh, share the wealth. And we always welcome for any comments. So have fun, be bold, be brave. And remember, learning is intentional, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you Thank so you. much for having me. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, Bye. Thank you for listening to Full Prefrontal, exposing the mysteries of executive function. To contact your host, Sucheta Kamath, and learn more about her work on improving executive function, visit her website at exqinfinitenowhow.com. That's www.exqinfinitenowhow.com. Tune in next week for another informative episode of Full Prefrontal, hosted by the founder of EXQ, Sucheta Kamath.